Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. We're going to get started. Um, my name is uh, Ben Wagner, and I'm uh, the president of uh, the Health and Human Rights Association. Um, and I'm also joined today by uh, Nidhi, our chair of personnel, and Nora, our chair of admin. Um, and today we have a really amazing panel discussion on migration, health, and human rights. And what we're going to be discussing about um, here is, you know, what are the major implications of migration on public health as well as on the health of the individual? And, you know, what is some of the work being done here at NYU uh, and NYC and, you know, globally um, to support migrants uh, and their health and also, you know, the right, um, you know, to uh, health. Um, and joining us today is uh, Natalie Spoutros, who is the advisor um, uh, adolescent Sexual and Reproductive Health and Contraception at International Rescue Committee. Uh, Dr. Megan Gallagher, uh, who's advisor and research monitoring evaluation at Save the Children uh, USA. And Dr. Alan Keller, who is Associate Professor of Medicine at NYU School of Medicine and founder of the Bellevue NYU Program for Survivors of Torture. Uh, so basically, the general format that we're gonna do for this panel um, is we'll take a few moments uh, for each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves um, and tell us a little bit about their background and the work that they do at their respective organizations. Uh, and then I'll kick off the conversation and ask a couple of questions that you know draw out some of the trends, um, migration in recent years, and what are some of the health implications, um, and you know what is the work being done to address these issues. And then, um, <coughs> lastly, we'll open up the floor to questions uh, from the audience. Um, so if that sounds good, we'll start uh, with the panel introduction. So then, yeah. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Natalie Skolotros. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. I work for the International Rescue Committee, otherwise known as IRC. IRC is a non-governmental organization headquartered in New York. We have offices in over 35 different countries worldwide and 25 different U.S. cities. Our main mission is to help uh, people whose lives have been shattered by conflict and disaster to survive, recover, and gain control of their futures. We do this implementing a number of different types of programming, health programming, of course, but also education, protection, gender-based violence prevention and response programming, a lot of governance work, as well as resettlement work here in the United States. Um, in the US, we work um, to make sure that refugees who have been uh, chosen to resettle here in the United States are able to acclimate to their new lives and are given the tools that they need to thrive here. Um, in the most recent future, we've also opened up offices in the Latin America region uh, due to some uh, new emergencies that have arisen there. And of course, all of the different migration issues that um, you likely will be talking about today. Um, and we've also opened up offices in Europe, um, very much in the same vein, uh, really thinking about all of the migrants that are coming in um, uh, in the Mediterranean and really working with European governments to figure out how they can, one, um, better respond to their needs, and two, even working with uh, governments like Germany to, to think about how they can uh, structure resettlement programming for those refugees as well. Um, I primarily work on uh, sexual and reproductive health programming, uh, supporting uh, several multi-country projects uh, really aimed at improving adolescent access to uh, sexual and reproductive health <coughs> services. I'll stop there. Hi, let me know if you can't hear me. I'm not going like, to lean into it. Um, my name is Megan Gallagher. I work at Save the Children, which is co-headquartered in Washington, D.C. and Connecticut. I strangely get to work from New York, um, which is unusual, but nice. Um, and I've been at SAVE for about three and a half years. SAVE works, um, SAVE is a really large organization. I work in 135 countries um, around the world, um, both in humanitarian response, so responding to natural disasters, wars, um, but also in um, development settings. So instances where you're really working in under-resourced countries to strengthen health systems. I'm kind of coming from a health lens, but government systems, um, working with governments to um, ensure financing for ongoing programs, et cetera. Um, my work at SAVE uh, is primarily in research and monitoring and evaluation. So 
looking, and I work on the humanitarian side, and like Natalie, um, my work is primarily in maternal newborn sexual and reproductive health. Um, but I've, I also do um, a lot of infectious disease response work, um, mostly due to um, recent events uh, with Ebola and the DRC. I happen to speak French, and so you get pulled in on all sorts of things here and there for that reason. Um, so my work, um, in terms of in terms of research, is is really um, is really operational research, or um, it kind of it goes by lots of implementation science. People call it all different sorts of things, but basically the idea is. Um, looking at our programs and looking at the things that we're doing within our programs and trying to figure out if they're working. Um, and sometimes, especially in humanitarian settings, that's really hard to do. Um, I have a research background, a PhD in public health, and you know, a lot of a lot of my training is, you know, what do you do in an environment where everything is working according to plan? And the thing about working in situations of migration is that almost never is anything working according, totally according to plan. And so it's actually been a really exciting place to kind of test our interventions and see what's working and what's not, because we're working in so many diverse settings. Um, you know, just kind of even thinking about the types of migration that we're, we're addressing. We work in Yemen, which is in the middle of a massive civil war. We work in the DRC, where you have people who've been um, kind of in protracted crisis for, for, for decades now. Um, you know, we're working in more stable places in Somalia where, you know, there's occasionally um, uprisings and there's also ongoing drought. Um, and so looking at all of these different places and, and being able to come up with models, intervention models, so, you know, a health program or, um, you know, something that targets groups that are often left out, like adolescents or people with disabilities, and being able to test it in all of those different environments and see if it's something that can be scaled up or if it's something that really is kind of specific to a particular group of people. And I think it's been really exciting to come up with some models that really are replicable in a lot of different places. Um, and then, you know, doing the next step of what can make them more cost effective or what can, um, you know, make them more compelling to donors so that, that we have the money to scale them up more broadly. Um, so so that's, that's what I do. I think I'll probably be able to get into like a bit more of the nuance of it as we go on with, with our conversation, but I feel like that's a, a good starting place. Thanks. Well, hi. Uh, I'm uh, Alan Keller. <coughs> I'm a physician. Uh, I am a general internist, primary care physician, and um, I uh, teach at NYU School of Medicine, as Ben said, and also have the privilege of uh, teaching at NYU Gallatin. And I've also had interactions with the uh, uh, College of Public Health uh, here. Um, so the lens that I look at the world, one of the lenses, is the lens of health and human rights. That when human rights are promoted, health is promoted. When human rights are violated, <clears throat> there are untoward, devastating health consequences for the individual and the community. And so my work is in, I guess, three or four broad areas. Uh, first, clinical work, uh, then education, research, and advocacy. And I think these are all, you're all students here at the College of, okay. So these are all things that, uh, that you can think about. So first of all, clinical. Um, I uh, had the privilege of founding a program called the Bellevue NYU Program for Survivors of Torture, where we care for asylum seekers primarily and refugees who've suffered really horrific things. The bottom line is if somebody walks in to our program at Bellevue, which is a refugee camp con conveniently located in Midtown Manhattan, it's the oldest public hospital in the country, uh, we help to rebuild their lives. And we do that by providing medical, mental health, social, and legal services. And so one of the things I really encourage you to do is think about connecting the dots in different ways, health and human rights, but also these different facets of health, physical, psychological, social. Uh, and when we're at our best, we're really addressing all of them. Uh, so for example, you know, may have some, a student activist from an African country who was horribly beaten, perhaps sexually assaulted, comes to us with physical pain, nightmares, homelessness, and we try and connect the dots and address all of these things in a holistic way. And it's very gratifying. I mean, we cared for about six, 7,000 individuals, and many of them are now US citizens or reunited with their families. So the direct service thing, and I still see patients uh, uh, once, once uh, a week. 
Uh, education. We train a lot of medical students, residents, interns. I will uh, just give a shout out. I've known Ben uh, since uh, before he was in college. Uh, and I really look forward to when he's my boss. So just remember, I treated you pretty well. So, you know, a really important thing. Treat those, uh, you know, always look for opportunities to be a mentor. And yeah, just be nice because one day they will be your boss. Um, so we do a lot of training on, and, and in fact, the training not only is with health providers, but uh, next week, I'm going down to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center where we train asylum uh, officers uh, who are the ones interviewing uh, asylum seekers at the border. Uh, research. Uh, I am not, I, 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 instead of getting my MPH, I went and I worked in a refugee camp for, uh, for two years. And I'm very fortunate though to work with some really skilled methodologists. But the research I've done is on the health consequences of trauma, of refugees, the prevalence of human rights abuses among these populations. And most recently, I've been doing a lot of work on immigration detention, where individuals come, and when they come here seeking freedom, they're put in these awful detention centers where they may languish for months and years. So a reminder that trauma isn't something that just ended where they left, but continues. And then finally, advocacy, which is, to me, advocacy is about change. And uh, I've been advocating, you know, for more humane conditions in immigration detention, which is unfortunately going the wrong way. I did a lot of work after 911 when it was very clear that U.S. health professionals had participated in torture. So I did a lot of the work documenting uh, that. Um, and you know, I think for all of us, and I was just struck in talking to my colleagues, and maybe this is one thing we can also say is that I don't, none of my colleagues are morose. Like, and that's how I feel, you know, I, I mean, for me, my joke is, you know, I care for torture victims. My wife, who's my best friend, uh, cares for victims of domestic violence. But we play a lot of miniature golf, and that seems to keep us grounded. So part of the thing, a challenge for all of you, as I found, is what do you do to keep safe? And for me, in addition to miniature golf and time with the family, is I'm a garden hawk. And so. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you so much for the introductions. So I guess one of the first questions that I've asked you, Megan, is what are some of the you know implications of migration on health that are unique to migrants? Um, you know, kind of you know throughout the process. So the pre-migration factors and, and how does that all relate to health and challenges from the public health system? So I think. Can you hear me? Um, so I think. I think one of the things that makes this question a little hard to answer is that migration really varies. There are a lot of there are a lot of elements of migration that can vary. And I think, you know, it often will matter where you're coming from, where you're going to, what that journey looks like, um, and then sort of where you end up and how long that lasts. And so, you know, I think a migration oftentimes when people are migrating internally, um, you know, your, your culture might not be changing that much. You still sort of know who the people who are kind of grounding your community are. Um, oftentimes, you know, not always, but oftentimes linguistically, you know, you're still able to communicate. I think there are also situations where people are, are refugees and are moving from one country to another and thinking about, you know, Syrians who are now living in Lebanon or Syrians who are now living in Greece and, and how different those cultural contexts are and how, in many cases, receiving places are not always greeting people who are migrants with open arms. I think, you know, we see it, and we see that in so many contexts. We see it right here in the United States very strongly right now. We see it um, pretty much everywhere we work. There's, there is a fear that if you let more people in, you will not have the same resources available to you. Um, and so kind of thinking, thinking about those different phases that you, that you touched upon, I think, you know, beforehand and thinking about health specifically, uh, you know, where people are coming from and how healthy they are when they're coming, I think is a huge thing that matters. You know, along the way, when people are moving, um, your health is generally going to decline. You're not going to have the, ac you're not going to have access to basic things that keep us healthy, food, clean water at the same level you were previously. And so there's often a deterioration of health during that migration, <coughs> kind of regardless of, regardless of what your situation was and where you're going. Um, you know, I think 
over the years, just kind of the UN systems that we have and the systems that are in place, oftentimes um, because of just sort of global governance, I think um, the expected the expected um, interventions for refugees are sometimes clearer than people who are migrating for economic reasons or people who are internal migrants. Um, so, for, you know, internally displaced people who are moving within their own country because of conflict. I think, um, you know, there is a UN response to being a refugee and there are, there's been a lot of good, good, important work done around the rights of refugees um, that, you know, I, I don't mean to imply that being a refugee is by any means easy, but I feel like that very particular type of migration has been systematized in a way over the last many decades and due to a lot of really hard work um, in a way that, you know, some of some of the more, was becoming now the more common, there are more IDPs in the world than there are refugees. And so how we, how we ensure that people who are moving internally or moving by choice are also able to access care um, can be quite hard. And, and, and so I think, you know, something that we try to do a lot at, at SAVE is to really try to do a lot of our health delivery services through kind of community-based efforts. So not going outside of existing systems wherever possible so that you can strengthen the health system, but also um, kind of meet, meet people where they are. Being able to be on the ground and ensure that not only are you ensuring quality of care, which is a human right, for those who are migrants, but also for the host communities, whoever they may be, um, which just reduces that, that animosity. And then I think, you know, on the other end, so you've moved, you've either moved back, you've stayed where you are, you know, we're seeing more and more in the world that, that people who are displaced are remaining displaced. I think the average is 17 years, um, which is a really long time. I mean, that's that's a childhood. That's, that's a, 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 it's getting longer and I, and I think, you know, thinking about how we respond in the way of healthcare <coughs> provision, it, it can't always, it can't be an emergency forever. It can't be, you know, refugee camp food rations forever. You have to think about ways to transition people if that is sort of their, their what feels like a permanent situation. You know, how do you, how do you train people up? How do you make sure that not only there's access to good healthcare, but that there's also access to education and ways to advance. And so, you know, I think at, at each stage, kind of the pre-migration, the migration, and then the post-migration, whatever that may be, whether it's a return or it's a new life somewhere else, um, how not only do you provide help, but how do you ensure that there are integrated quality services? And that, and that means oftentimes working outside of your own organization. So, you know, Save the Children does a lot of things that we don't do everything, and so teaming up with mental health agencies, teaming up, I think, especially with local organizations. We're seeing more and more the importance of people who are from a situation being able to provide much better um, advice, much better um, program design than people who are coming from the outside. So how can you kind of coordinate all these things so that you really can look at the whole person um, throughout that cycle? No, I think that's great. I think also touching on, you know, IDPs, I think they're often a population that, you know, gets forgotten easily when we talk about migration. And we, you know, forget to think about all the people that are still, that can't leave, you know, their countries and are unable to, you know, travel and cross borders. So, you know, Natalie, you mentioned that a lot of the programs are, the programs you work on exclusively focus on IDPs. So what are some of the issues, you know, that IDPs face that, you know, are specific and unique to them? And how have some of the interventions you've worked on, you know, tried to address those? Yeah, um, thanks, Megan, because I think you've touched upon so many of those issues already. Um, we were talking before uh, the panel about a project I am working on in Nigeria and South Sudan. Uh, the project is being implemented in two areas that host a large internally displaced population. Um, in Nigeria, it's in northeast Nigeria, uh, in north the northeastern part of the country, um, very much a Boko Haram stronghold. Um, and one other trend that we're seeing within migration and the humanitarian system overall is an increased number of IDPs and displaced populations that are now living in urban or peri-urban environments 
which also, as implementers, makes us have to rethink what that model of humanitarian assistance and health system strengthening really looks like. So for us, um, partnerships with the Ministry of Health, both in Nigeria and South Sudan, um, also uh, serving a, a large um, population of IDPs, um, a lot of the work that we're doing is actually working within uh, the Ministry of Health and within the existing health system um, in, in more uh, deliberate and uh, focused efforts to strengthen that health system. And that is really, really <coughs> difficult when, uh, when you are dealing with conflict, when you are dealing with uh, large, major nationwide system disruptions. Um, and so I think that's, that's a real issue too, right? Um, Megan touched upon the fact that refugees often have a lot of uh, uh, rights and responsibilities that are offered them through um, you know, different treaties as well as uh, UN agencies that are responsible for seeing those through. It's a little bit more trickier, so it really requires coordination and collaboration and really strong relationships with host governments to really move that work forward in, within an ID. And you know it's interesting because I know Dr. Keller, you do a lot of work in immigration detention facilities in the U.S. So people that have traveled borders and have experienced you know awful trauma in their home countries come here often to get re-traumatized in a lot of these detention centers. And what are so, what are the health you know impacts you know of putting a migrant who you know might be a refugee or an asylum seeker in a detention facility? <coughs> well, Building on the comments of my colleagues, which I think raised crucial issues, not the least of which is the distinctions between refugees, internally displaced, working with local uh, partners, and I'm really struck actually, and this is, this is what you see in the good people in this field, is there's a lot of humility uh, and a lot of thinking about, okay, how do we empower local groups? Um, unfortunately, where I'm doing the work right now in the U.S. is completely about disempowering these immigration detention facilities. And so just, I want to back up a little before the individual ends up in a detention facility. So I think one thing that's important with all migrants, whether it's internally displaced, refugees, asylum seekers, is why did they leave in the first place? Did they leave because of a natural disaster? And then even then, well, did they have to leave in a natural disaster, such as in Haiti, where most houses were built so that they could not possibly withstand any earthquake, let alone you know, a, a horrific one? Uh, with the population I deal mostly with, asylum seekers, a term that I must say, a positive, that term is out there more than it's ever been. I'm not sure people entirely get it, what it means. By definition, what it means is this person left not because they wanted to, but because they had no choice, because they were persecuted, maybe simply for being a woman, or because of their beliefs, uh, their political ideals, or being their sexual orientation, their religion. And so they're individuals who suffered profound trauma in their own countries, including this thing we call torture, where there is also international conventions about what that is. Um, you know, it's severe physical or mental suffering. But it may or may not be the worst thing that happened to individuals. And often among the worst things that happened are having been forced to leave. And so individuals flee. And trauma, I would say, it, there's a dose effect to it. You know, it makes sense. The, the more bad things that happen, the more you are at risk for really devastating health problems, including depression and, and post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, and all of the health uh, things related. So individuals flee. They then, for example, let's take the case of the southern border. Uh, we've got a lot of Central Americans there, and I wouldn't be surprised, and I know from some studies I've done, uh, that there's a substantial number of individuals who are coming for economic reasons. But uh, based on a study I did about two, three years ago uh, on the, on the uh, southern border, I think over two-thirds of the individuals were leaving uh, because of the violence. And when asked the question, if not for the violence, would you have left your country? The answer was no. Uh, so then they get to the border. And things have always been rough there. And immigration detention did not start under President Trump, although he's taken it to a, a new low or a new level. President Obama, very uh, enlightened in many ways, but family detention actually started under, under his watch. 
So, but now, it, asylum seekers come to the border. A lot of them aren't even being let in. So as awful as immigration detention is, some of these encampments on the other side of the uh, US border in Mexico are even worse because you have individuals, many of whom are women and children, who fled uh, violence and are now basically kind of swimming with sharks that these local gang, uh, gangs and cartels are taking advantage of them. And that's because the US has started a policy called metering where we're you know, only letting in a few people. Um, my guess, and I'm a little suspicious about this, I wonder if we, part of the flow, what determines the flow of individuals at the border is how many immigration detention beds we have. Um, the, among the larger donors to President Trump, and I, I think we may all see this, but I have never in my 30 years of doing this work seen things as, as frightening, as desperate, and as earnest uh, as they are. I will say also, I've, I've never been more inspired by my colleagues. So it brings out the best and the worst. But <clears throat> these integration detention centers, it's a boom business. One, among the larger donors to President Trump were these private immigration prisons. And so immigrant detainees are, it's a cash cow. Another thing motivating this is that there have been parole reforms in the US. And so there are county jails, including mine. I live in Essex, liberal Essex County, you know, across the uh, border in uh, New Jersey. And half the uh, people in the detention facility there, in, in the county jail, are immigrant detainees who are non-criminal civil things. Mo many of them came from abroad. They may have also been picked up in these, in these work rates. But these detention centers, basically are like supermax facilities. They are often windowless, converted warehouses where I spent a lot of time this summer in Louisiana, uh, five hours in the middle of nowhere. And at one of these facilities, these were asylum seekers who were, for example, somebody persecuted because they're gay and was beaten by gangs and the government didn't do anything to stop it. Um, and they are wearing at this at this facility, Jackson Parish, Louisiana. They're wearing black and white prison jumpsuits. It's like the freaking chain gang. Um, and so the trauma, you have individuals who were traumatized in their country. They are traumatized perhaps by a very dangerous journey, which kind of speaks to how awful things are that they went through all of this to get there. And then they're put in these supermax prisons. Where, and, and what's scary about Louisiana, where they've opened 9,000 beds, I think, like in the last year, is that the, one of the most important factors, if you, are, if you are an asylum seeker, or if you're a detained immigrant, is whether or not you have legal representation. I have one thing to choose would be get lawyers for everyone in the, in, in the immigration system. And, and, and about two thirds of the individuals I know in Louisiana are unrepresented. So one of the things uh, it, which combines clinical work is documentation. So I actually have spent a lot of time in Louisiana evaluating individuals and writing affidavits so hopefully that they can be released or granted asylum. But there's so many and only one of me. So one thing I've been doing, and, and Ben's been working with me on this, is we're, we're working to develop training systems to have local providers to also think of ways of doing these evaluations telephonically. I think, as, as my, I think you alluded to, things change. And yeah, the situation is subject to change. And so you're always thinking on your, you know, uh, whatever, about how to, to best make the, the, the use of resources. But in my view, immigration detention is nothing short of a national disgrace. And it really speaks to how we have criminalized, stigmatized, and vilified uh, immigrant uh, populations in an incredibly cruel way. And I'll just leave you with one last thing. I have a patient of mine from Cameroon who lost his leg because he was in a dirty prison there and had to get an amputation in Cameroon. He was held in the Elizabeth Detention Center outside of uh, New York. He now, 20 years later, he's a nurse, he's a US citizen, but if I mention Elizabeth Detention, he shrugs and almost like shaking. That I think for him, that traumatic experience is as bad or worse 
And what I've heard from a lot of people is, you know, I expected to be mistreated, tortured in my country. I never thought when I came to the United States, I'd be treated like that. And so that's one of the things that I'm working to, to try and change in a sustainable way. Um, and I'd like to thank the president for pointing out in so many ways and making it so bad that uh, maybe we'll finally get change after him. Yeah, so thank you for sharing you know, some of the unique circumstances that migrants are placed in and what those challenges are then to that you know, that's public health and also the health of the individual. So, I mean, I'll open this question up to, you know, everyone on the panel. You know, what do you think the role of public health is in addressing some of these problems um, in my region? What are our obligations? Or are there any obligations uh, that we have as a country, you know, to help people streaming, you know, over our borders? Or even, you know, in, in places of humanitarian crisis, right? In places in other countries, uh, do we have an obligation to help people? Or what role can we play in, in trying to make, you know, improving those lives? That's a loaded question. Um, just forgive me if I need a second to just reflect. I mean, I think, um, you know, a lot of folks who work in organizations that receive funding from the U.S. government, for example, that earmarks a certain amount of foreign aid assistance to public health programming um, or to humanitarian programming. Um, and in this current administration, a lot of those uh, funds have been drastically cut. Um, and so one, I mean, I think it's it's necessary to recognize that a lot of this is um, uh, personality or administration driven. Um, but certainly there are advocates both in the government as well as within you know, the wider humanitarian aid slash uh, uh, public policy field that are advocates and really recognize the importance of funding public health, not only in the humanitarian aid sector, but in uh, development and even here in the US or globally. I think one of the perfect examples is, uh, think about the Ebola outbreak um, in West Africa a few years ago and, um, so much of, 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 I think, in my perspective, fear was driving a lot of the funds that were going in there because people didn't want that, that uh, epidemic to come to the US, it certainly did. Um, but I, I think um, in, you can make the case that it's um, in our best interest to, to sort of uh, bring up the entire boat, right? Lift all tides. Um, but I think it's also, it, you know, Epidemics are changing, public health is changing, and I think it's in, ev in anyone's, in everyone's interest. And I think, you know, as as people who, um, especially as a New Yorker born and bred, I think uh, you're living in a city where everyone's your neighbor. And I think globalization is coming to a point where um, you can't be uh, excluding um, an entire population. This is a, a moment in time where we have the largest number of displaced people in the world, um, we can't ignore it anymore. I'm not sure if anyone has thoughts, other thoughts. I feel like this is a tricky question because I think I could answer it a lot of ways. I think, I think we don't actually have an obligation to act, but I think it is in, it is ethically right to act, and it is also beneficial to all of us to act. I think, um, we think about public health and the things that public health has done. Um, one of one of the, the schools that I, the school I attended for my PhD, their tagline was "Protecting health and saving lives, millions at a time." It was like the only thing that we had to know before we left. And I I think about that a lot because that that really is like in a in a, in a soundbite like what public health is. And I I've always kind of thought of public health as being um, quite special in that way. That that with you know, a population focus, you can protect a lot of people at once. Does that mean that everybody in a population is going to get like the best, most specialized care? No, but that's not what public health is. And so I think we have tools as public health practitioners to, that, can, that can benefit wide swaths of the population at once. And by addressing certain things like infectious disease outbreaks, STIs, um, contraception, we can do things like prevent the spread of HIV, we can prevent unintended pregnancies, 
we can prevent early childhood death. All of these things that, that actually have like pretty simple time-tested interventions, and we know how to do that. And so I think it's, it's, it's not so much that we're obligated to, but we should. And I think from a pure fear perspective, if you want to appeal to those isolationists in the United States who say we shouldn't be helping people globally because we need to focus on our own country and we need our own jobs, I think we live in a very global society. And so international epidemics are going to eventually have negative consequences on, on us as individuals. They're going to have negative economic impacts. They're going to have negative health impacts. Um, people are traveling all the time. Our food comes from all over the place. There are so many ways that having a healthy world is going to be beneficial to us as individuals. So, so almost from like a selfish perspective, we have an obligation to act. And so I think, you know, for me, and I would imagine for a lot of you, since you're here and this is what you're studying, there is an, a, a, an ethical drive to doing this work. Um, I also think there's a really practical um, health and, and benefit for the world um, that also should drive in. So it's, it's, it's not so much are we obligated to, I think it's we should, and I also think we should be really aware of the fact that sometimes when we act, what we do has unintended consequences. And I think being cognizant of the things that we're doing and making sure that when we do things, we're, we're measuring and evaluating what we're doing um, so that if we make mistakes, we don't make those mistakes again. And I think, you know, kind of going back to a conversation earlier, I think involving the populations of interest in your program design, in your research, so that you're not making stupid mistakes um, is really important. Actually, this is a bit of a tangent, but um, a, a quick story. So we do a lot of work, um, save the children kind of broadly. So save US, save Sweden, save Denmark, a lot of a lot of a lot of kind of the broader save is really focused on preventing early child marriage, um, and we were doing a lot of early child marriage prevention in Yemen because with the war, uh, girls are getting married at younger ages for economic reasons. It brings um, you know some an infusion of cash to families. Girl families feel like their daughters are then kind of protected and set for life and. And so we're seeing those those marriage rates um, getting lower and lower. And it was concerning to a lot of people and there have been all these massive campaigns. And so within my um, kind of smaller reproductive health po focused project, we were doing some evaluation around the success of the project and looking at why adolescents were or weren't accessing services. And we had kind of generally been seeing our adolescent numbers go up and then they sort of like flatlined for a bit. And so we were doing some focus group discussions with women and girls um, and, and men in Yemen. And it turns out that all of the, all of the work around preventing early child mar childhood marriage was making those who were married feel quite stigmatized. And they, you know, they were saying, well, we don't want to go to the health center. We don't want to access these services because we know that this is bad, but this is just the situation that we're in. And so we feel like, you know, save the children who's always talking to us about not getting married when we're girls is gonna just like judge us when we go and try to seek these health services. And so, you know, that's one really small thing, but I think trying to figure out some of the nuance beneath what we're doing, especially because a lot of our public health work is kind of these big, large population-based things where you're not thinking about individual patients, but you're thinking about populations. And so, you know, making sure that along with acting, there's also um, questioning and evaluating and returning back to your original question or hypothesis to make sure um, that the work that you're doing is benefiting people in the way that you're hoping it is. You know, there's a Latin phrase uh, that's embedded into us from the first day of med school, primum non serum, above all, do no harm. And I, I think your point is really important about that, that thinking even in advance uh, when you go to develop a public health intervention, you know, what are some of the unintended consequences uh, that may happen, or what are some of the intended? I think global health is a wonderful field, it's become something of a buzzword, but it needs to be done right. It needs, as I said, to be done with humility, with local partnerships, and and you know, one of the things is that when you leave 
uh, things are better, not worse, uh, because of you. So in terms of the obligate responsibilities of public health, so first of all, all of you are public health students, and I want to just let you off the, uh, you know, well, basically encourage you, this is a very special time in your lives. It's a little bit of a cocoon. It can feel frustrating. I know a lot of you have come from that doing important things, and we'll go back to that, but view this as an important time to really just, you know, savor and learn and as, as much as you can, because it's, it's really special. I mean, uh, you learn, continue learning is a lifelong thing, but just one thing to uh, think about. Uh, then, <clears throat> afterwards, I think some of the important things in applying public health are, one, rigorous methodology in, in, in doing studies and really questioning uh, oneself. I do think when we do good, rigorous research, though, it's not enough to just do the, the study. I, I do think we have an obligation to speak out and use it for appropriate advocacy. And I'm a big believer that evidence, even though maybe that's you know not so much in flavor these days, makes for really good, effective advocacy. And I know my colleagues uh, at SAVE and IRC are you know, really you know, taking this to a high level that when we say things, it matters, and it's based on, you know, not just, well, my opinion, it's, it's, it's based on evidence. I then think, just as I was posing the question about when dealing with migration, you're asking why did individuals leave, I think it really is important to ask yourself about the human rights perspective of what caused this, and then what's known as the social determinants of health. So, for example, I mean, the problems with, uh, with, with uh, girls marrying early, um, you know, that has real health consequences. But it's happening in also in a human rights context and probably in a context because it's a male-run society. I mean, I, I am from the school. Well, Hillary Clinton, you know, among the things she said was women's rights are human rights. And I do believe the world would be a better place if, if women were, uh, were, were in charge or will be in charge. Um, but, uh, you know, thinking about what were the underlying social constructs and, you know, power constructs that caused this and how to address it. But, as we said, you have to do it in a smart way and, 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 and kind of adjusting that when you find out, oh, you did this thing and now people are feeling stigmatized and staying away. Uh, you know, I think that can, you know, happen a lot. And, and just, it, it's, it's always unusual what things in public health perhaps do or don't work. I mean, we know, for example, you know, the importance of vaccinations, but one of the lessons I learned early on in my career was the importance, for example, of literacy, that, uh, you know, the, a very powerful determinant of decreasing infant morbidity and mortality is to have more, uh, more mothers literate. So by thinking about these social determinants, as I said, it has very real uh, public health uh, implications and hopefully in a way to pull up the, the pop, promote health in the population. Sorry, um, thank you so much, both of you have raised so many interesting points and something that um, came sort of front of mind um, as both of you were talking about this is something that IRC is struggling with right now um, and that's uh, how do we balance scale with program quality? Oftentimes, we have limited pots of funding that we are given to implement programs in some of the most hardest um, to operate in environments, right? Um, we're facing insecurity and providers that, that lack the, the technical competencies to deliver quality services, and we have to balance that with um, you know our obligation to provide as many services as we possibly can and and you know at, to what extent um, do we say hey we can't do this because the services that we are providing right now may do harm they are not of a good quality you know um, and and how do we incentivize ourselves as, a, as an organization from the health provider that's in that facility that doesn't have enough medication that is forced to be a mental health specialist, a sexual and reproductive health provider, uh, a nutrition specialist, um, and you know, responsible for all of these different competencies, um, working with uh, uh, inadequate supplies and medications, um, and, and asking so much of this one person, and then 
um, you know, seeing data that comes in that says, you know what, well, we've had seven women die in the last two months in, in you know, delivering their babies. What is our responsibility and, and how do we communicate and use our data and be very honest with our failures um, and, and talk to donors about the need for more funding, the need to prioritize uh, funding quality components of care versus maybe opening another seven facilities. Like how do we do that? And I think that's really hard as public health practitioners because you know, we're thinking about the public and you know, wider groups of people, uh, but we have to balance that with our responsibilities of providing good care. And that's really hard in, in our settings. So I guess just to follow up with that, you know, I guess each of you, what would you say is, you know, what would, advice would you offer to students who are passionate about working with migrants or are interested in working in a field of migrant health? You know, what are the competencies that are most important in working in this field? I think I think there are I think there are a lot of a lot of soft skills that are really important. Um, I think it's important to be flexible. I think it's important to be kind. I think it's important to be able to problem solve and to think quickly on your feet without getting too hung up on perfection. Um, so figuring out the way to get things done as well as possible given the constraints. Um, and I think, I think you know, there, there's an element of, of, of generosity of spirit. And I think whenever, you know, we're talking about migration, which, which looks, looks a lot of ways. Um, but whenever, whenever I think about global health and people who are early in careers in global health or transitioning to careers in global health, um, I think as much as possible, spend some, try to spend some time working for a chunk of time somewhere that's not here. Um, you know, I, I, I think about my, math, my my cohort when I did my master's, and almost everybody went, I, I, I studied forced migration um, for my master's, and almost everybody went to the field after they finished. And I, and I think, you know, some people had had a lot of field experience and some people hadn't. Um, and not everyone's still there. You know, some people work for like departments of health in San Diego now, but, um, but I, I think having the time in the field and really being able to see the constraints on the ground is so important. Um, because when you get to a point where you're working at a headquarters, it, you're often quite detached. And I think being part of the communities that you're working with makes such a difference. And having those challenges where you feel like you can't, like you get home at the end of the day and you're exhausted because you've been like trying to speak in different languages all day. And, but then someone says hi to you and recognizes you and like that feels better than anything else mm -hmm. and it's so simple and I think sometimes it's really easy to get caught up in a lot of the intricacies of this work and it is really intricate work um, but I do think that that being able to be a part of a community that you're then going to work with and for um, subsequently is really really important um, and then in terms of in terms of the skills that you're learning here um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of taking you know, those evaluation classes and those quant classes, being able to do um, a little bit of data analysis, being able to, I mean, it depends on what you want to do. Like if you're going to be an advocacy person, this might be less important. Um, but if you want to implement programs, I think like take those program planning classes and figure out how, even if it's at a pretty simple level, how to tell if what you're doing is working. Um, I know I kind of keep harkening back to this, but I feel like there's a lot of pressure to, to do things and you know we think that they're good and we move on. And I think a lot of times things aren't good. And I think, you know, the space is broadening. I I was looking at several conferences on the horizon and they all had like fail fests where everyone talks about the mistakes <laughs> they've made. Um, and I think that's actually a really good culture to adopt. So like what works and what doesn't, and like can we share that with, with other agencies? Um, and I think, you know, Save the Children has worked in partnership with a lot of agencies. Save and IRC work together. Natalie and I both work primarily on a very similar project. And I think, you know, one of the things that's really propelled it is that we do share a lot. And, and, and I think that that is really useful. And so, you know, focus, focus, you can always read about something. You can always talk to somebody about, about something. So, you know, though content area courses are really important, 
Um, I also think um, those really like applicable classes are worth taking. Um, and being able to finish a master's and say like, I can evaluate a project, I can design a program. Um, those are really great skills for getting hired. I'm willing to go to places that are hard. Um, I think that is really useful at the end of the day. I would echo what Megan just said um, in terms of really thinking about those research or evaluation courses that um, are cross-cutting so you can take them with you if you're working on a child health program or a sexual reproductive health program or a mental health program. I think they will serve you well. Um, one other thing that I um, have spoken to a lot of my interns um, about is really signing up for a number of different listservs. There are communities of practice um, that host webinars, in-person in meetings, and you know, I think the wonderful thing about public health is that we're constantly always learning. <laughs> we're always going to be, you know, in need of looking at the latest evidence and kind of sharing with each other. And so, really building that into your DNA right now as your sort of, um, you know, junior and starting off public health professionals, I think is really important. And simultaneously, that also helps you build networks and um, uh, connects you with people working in. You know all kinds of different organizations. Um, some great ones are the Interagency Working Group for Reproductive Health in Crisis. Um, doesn't cost you anything to join. They're constantly sending out information about upcoming events and calls. Um, the Core Health Group. Um, they're mainly focused on more development settings, but they are growing their communities of practice around humanitarian health issues. Um, Conflict in Health is a great peer-reviewed journal that synthesizes a lot of great up-and-coming and new uh, late-breaking evidence um, around you know these issues that we've talked about so I think just those are small things that you can do quite easily um, and then in terms of courses I think Megan and I share similar thoughts about that yeah um, I, I, I uh, echo my colleagues thoughts about the importance of learning real skills and, and rigor uh, I mean during my residency at Bellevue, I, I could put an IV in a rock with one hand tied behind my back and blindfold. And that was really important because I could be a nice guy, but if you're poking somebody 90 times, they want you the hell out of there. So, so you know, and, and similarly, during my residency, I, I was taught by some of the most gifted individuals about how to critique an article I was reading, and okay, is this valid what they're saying or not? Or as many of my, some of my professors taught me, there are lies, damn lies, and then there's likelihood ratios. So really knowing how to critically analyze these things. Uh, I also really agree with what was said about the importance, if you can, of living abroad. And actually, the longer you do it, the better. I've had the privilege of living for about two and a half years of my life internationally. But typically, I would, when I was like, for example, when I lived in uh, Cambodia, you know, after three months, and I was there for about a, a little over a year, after three months, I thought I knew what was going on. After six months, I realized I knew absolutely nothing. And after a year, I was like, well, I think I know how to frame the questions. And so that kind of framing and that humility uh, is really important. But for example, I did a lot of work, uh, epidemiological studies on the medical and social consequences of landmines. But it was informed by living in Cambodia where basically, you know, you, wherever you went, you saw limbless men, women, and children. So uh, I think, you know, learn your skills well, get the uh, ex experience, and then uh, also the other things we talked about in terms of local partnerships and, and humility.